welcome to this new episode of Norwich Theatre Talks. On this episode today, we're focusing on work that takes place in our small scale building, Stage 2, and in our playhouse. Our theme for today is exploration through creativity. At the end of this episode, I'll be talking to Fernando Santos Castilla, who is lucky enough to have the role as our Playhouse Bar Manager, and how we use creativity to create a safe space in the middle of our city. But my first guest is Dr Rosie Carrick, a poet, performer and academic, who's bringing her new show, Muscle Bound, to Stage 2 and touring around the country. Rosie, welcome to Norwich Theatre Talks. Now, you are in Norwich with us today because you've brought your show Musclebound to stage two. Tell us a little bit about the show. Um, uh, yes, nice to meet you. <laughs> yeah. um, the show is about a year in my life when I was... I'd just rewatched He-Man. I don't know if you remember Masters I of the Universe. I do remember He-Man. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I watched it when I was five at the cinema and it had this insane effect on me. Like, seeing these oiled up, enormously huge... I say these, obviously there's only one. Everyone else is fully clothed and perfectly normally sized. <laughs> it's, it's a lot about him, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, it gave me this crazy kind of feeling and, and really impacted my sort of erotic imagination in life as a child. And I rewatched it as a grown-up a few years ago at the same time as I was coming to terms with thinking that something was never quite right in my sexual relationships, but not not quite being able to look at what it was at the time. Yeah. And my daughter um, was just getting into her first sexual relationship as well. She was 17 at the time. And I had her when I got pregnant when I was 18, first year of university. Okay. Happy times. <laughs> <laughs> so I was really, it was like watching a mirror of myself in her having her first sexual experiences. Yeah. And I, so there was this clump of things going on, this kind of poking at me from the past saying, actually maybe what's not quite right here is because you're not looking at what you truly find erotically powerful yeah um and so it's i set out to really investigate what was it what what was it that was so powerful about the scenes what was so erotic about them what i could do to harness that power again in my yeah. sexual life as a grown up yeah and and as also talking with olive uh, about her first oh, your daughter. my daughter yeah, yeah sorry about what was going on for her and these things all kind of meld together in a way that um i guess creates a show about sexual power particularly yeah. as a woman in heterosexual sex yeah what it means to be sexually powerful yeah. what it takes to say what you want and not go along with a narrative that isn't yours that's fascinating and do you think that's, I mean, <clears throat> that generation and my, my generation too, sort of seeing that He-Man character, I mean, it, it was, you know, it was quite, quite a sexual awakening for a lot of people. I mean, this huge muscular guy, as you say, surrounded by lots of much less attractive <laughs> characters, you were being kind of guided towards that physique and that aesthetic. Yeah. In that. Do you think that's that's been powerful throughout history, that there has been the equivalent of He-Man in every generation that's been kind of put there as a, as a totem of beauty in some way. Well, the thing that's so interesting to me about He-Man and those kind of films around that time, Conan and Rambo and so on, is that you're right, we are being guided. I mean, we're kind of literally being guided by the camera, which, which really focuses mm. in on the chest. And when they're being tortured in these really homoerotic scenes, mm. It's, they're tortured on the chest, on the back, on the arms. We're continually being taken to the sights of this kind of ideal masculinity. Yeah, but yeah. it's coded in a totally non-sexy way. Like, you know, these are films... Obviously, He-Man is a kid's film, weirdly. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they're coded as films aimed at, um, you know, a straight, grown-up male audience. Yeah. And so there's this refusal to acknowledge the objectification that's going on. And gay culture quite rightly kind of co-opted it and recognized it and took it on and played into it but what I found when I started investigating it was that there's no space for the heterosexual female gaze I, I started yeah, yeah. um I mean I was qu I, I found ways to talk to both Dolph Lundgren and Arnold Schwarzenegger and ask them wow. about it and they were kind of blind to it even in retrospect they just yeah. couldn't see this what was going on 
it's it's quite a, it's quite gladiatorial an image isn't it and it takes my mind to that space that that sort of injury being sexualized almost and you know that kind of male controller of the gladiators yes yeah i read a really interesting academic article actually about the bond um novels and mm. about the way that they were at this time of the kind of fall of the british empire all about maintaining this kind of British male strength so that all of these foreign um, attacks, the foreign baddies, uh, the sort of uh, attacks on Bond were played out as seductions which allowed him to resist yeah. them. So it becomes this kind of reinforcement of, I mean, obviously the Bond novel is very British, kind of a different sort of thing yeah. in lots of ways, but it becomes a kind of reinforcement for Bond, at least, of Britishness, of heterosexuality, yeah. um, of masculinity. So, be, And I think this, the same is true with a lot of these films that were coming out during the Cold War, yeah. during a time of AIDS. Yeah. Um, this kind of, the sort of tail end of second wave feminism, really, in a similar way, actually, that now that there's this a real kind of female empowerment move, again, we're getting a lot of tortured beefcake in films right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that, that. That's become, and you know, there's there's this Love Island generation as well, isn't there, which is promoting again a very, very stereotypical way of looking and of what should be found attractive. Yes, yeah. yeah. I, what I love about, I watched one series of Love Island and I became so addicted, I thought, I can't go into this again. It just took up my whole summer. <laughs> <laughs> so... But what I really loved about it, because a lot of my friends were super snobby, and like, why, why are you watching this shit? But <laughs> it it shows you very clearly a way that relationships are played out mm. in a normal, in what for a lot of people is a normal way. Yeah. And you can see these um, frameworks, these gender frameworks at play, but also people are observing it and people are tweeting and writing in and saying, that's not okay. Or yeah. Yeah, so it's yeah. kind of, uh, for me, it was really interesting to see what the, I mean, uh, is Love Island, does it represent the mainstream of relationships? I don't know, I've, you know, who, who, knows? who knows? But a kind of general model of relationship um, under scrutiny, yeah. from, I found really interesting. And are you seeing, I mean, it's fascinating that, that He-Man and, you know, the, the issues therein the the gender imbalance you know all that that was painting has stuck with you for such a long time it, it, how did you come back to that has it always been there or was there some trigger to re to return to it and, and make the show well to be honest it, i always saw it and i still see them i mean obviously they are kind of problematic but i see them as a really brilliant thing when i was growing up they i think because they they resist objectification in the same way that if you had a woman in the role of He-Man and she had been stripped almost naked, yeah, she was yeah, yeah. being tortured while a room full of men were watching, it would feel like a very different thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She would she would not seem very powerful. Yeah. And we see that kind of scene with women's being women being tortured a lot in films and so on and kind of casually killed off or raped. Uh, but well, some... the She-Ra character was not that, was she? No, <laughs> no. Did you watch that He-Man, um, the documentary about the making of He-Man? I did. I, oh I... my God, it was so interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She was originally designed as a much more muscular character. Was she? But they thought it wasn't feminine enough. Ah, and although she yeah. had a sword, she was never allowed to use it. Remember she had that beam that yes. came out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if ever she used it to hurt someone, it was always by accident she fell over and it did it yeah. or something like this. So really interesting kind of dynamics there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but, it, but, but to be honest, for me, the, the real sexual, this kind of gender imbalance I was finding that the show is about is me looking back on all of my sexual experiences as a confident woman and mm. as a performer and as a very sexually open woman I've always been. But as Olive was getting into her first sexual experience, I was thinking, actually, what is going on in my sex life? Because I, I, I came to be aware of or face the fact that actually for a lot of my sexual past I'd been you know having grown up with Jessica Rabbit, Lara Croft, hmm. Catwoman, all these sexy yeah, yeah, yeah. sexy characters who were written of course by men <laughs> but but really playing into it to be powerful meant playing into the the, the powerful thing yeah. and I was able to do that very well yeah N not just as a stage person but also in relationships you know men were kind of intimidated by me and I would be very um sexually adventurous do all of these things but often I was quite disconnected from my own personal sexual pleasure yeah and so for me 
it wasn't it, the show isn't about me kind of picking apart these films and saying what's wrong with them for me it's like why was i able to feel such intense personal power and erotic freedom while watching these films which feature almost all men yeah yeah, yeah. when as a sexy woman in my own relationships i wasn't feeling the same thing and what what both of the dynamics are kind of weird so it's about trying yeah, yeah, to yeah. With Olive as the sort of counterpoint, because seeing her just getting into this world, thinking, shit, how can I put these together and um, be satisfied, basically. And do you think that world that Olive is entering into now is is an easier world in a world where, you know, th- th- there's no more one foot on the floor for all time? That, that was the BBC thing, wasn't it? <laughs> when you show sex, do you remember that? Mm. One foot on the floor. And, and where sexuality is de- um, demonstrated and portrayed in media in a much more diverse way than it was, where we can be, to a degree, some people more open. Do you think that world is easier now? Uh, well, in some ways it is. Certainly, the, like, the kind of public sex positivity and p- positivity around female sexuality, female masturbation, which was completely never even spoken yeah, yeah, about yeah. when I was growing up, is far more pre- you know open and prevalent. But there's still, you know, Olive came home from school and was saying that in biology they were taught about they were taught about sex and that her male biology teacher, and she was telling me in a kind of, oh my God, this is so embarrassing sort of way, but she said, you know, he was saying these things. I said, what was he saying? He said, the man puts his penis in and out of the woman's vagina and this is what creates pleasure for both parties. And I was like, no, <laughs> but still like- Textbook. The, yeah, yeah, exactly. But, but I mean, speaking of textbooks, there's still the, like the full anatomy of the clitoris, which is kind of it's almost the same as the penis, all the kind of internal structures is still, not shown in school Mm. textbooks and still not in medical you can still be a gynecologist and not have studied the full structure of the clitoris so that's one thing a basic kind of lack of education and understanding that still prevails but presumably that's that's kind of deeply rooted in this you know there's a lot that the victorians brought to us isn't there that that still pervades and there's that you know sex is a function you know if it's for pleasure, you ought to feel guilty. Yeah, exactly. About it. Yeah, yeah. And and the fact that the clitoris is the only organ that exists solely for fun, solely for pleasure, <laughs> is kind of like. So I guess, but something that I assumed that things were different because of this. There's so much more information on the internet. There's so mm-hmm. much more openness. But when Olive did first have sex, she was like, "Oh, I really thought it would be different." And she went to her friends. She told me that she went to her friends and said, because they had had sex, said when you had sex, did you have an orgasm? And they were like, oh no. Yeah. She was like, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, why, why didn't you tell me that? Yeah. What, you know, and, and when I was growing up, similar thing, you know, you'd have sex, be like, oh my God, it was so cool. No, I certainly didn't. None of the other girls I knew, and even as grown ups, we weren't saying each other, yeah, but did you actually have an orgasm? Mm. And I, I, after a while, I became afraid. I, you know, on the one hand, I was thinking, is it just me? Am I mm. some kind of freak? Or more terrifyingly, will they all say no and we realize we've all just been performing this kind of pleasure for the men that who have been yeah, our yeah. sexual partners yeah, yeah and that seems to from what the conversation i had with olive that seems to not have changed yeah it, it struck me i think it was last week i don't know whether you saw this but it was a big anniversary of queer as folk russell t davis's mm. um tv series that you know as 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 a gay man growing up that was an iconic moment and I was watching some of the narrative around this, and it's quite similar to what you say. It was a revelatory moment for a lot of people. And um, I-, I saw somebody say, a, 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 a heterosexual um, person say, well, it was that point I realised what it is they do. Yeah. It's <laughs> even as basic as that. Yeah. You know, and then for a whole gay generation, realising that actually sometimes it's not very good. You know, this whole kind of thing around sex is it always must be amazing. And actually, yeah. you know, it, it makes it real for people that art can do that, that can't it? Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. And I think there's so much, that's a really good parallel example. And there was so much, I mean, when I was a teenager growing up in the 90s and it was the kind of ladette movement and, yeah. uh, you know, yeah, and yeah. so there's this sense that being being a successful sexual woman meant enjoying everything being up for everything but actually kind of reflecting whatever your partner wanted to do and being vociferous about it and 
and even you know it's not i'm not trying to say that i spent all of this time pretending to enjoy sex when i wasn't far from it but um there's a sense that in in a basic way not being able to say actually the way that we experience sexual pleasure is different and this is the way that it is for me yeah and it's going to need this and it's going to take some time and we're so conditioned still i think as girls and women not to say that it feels so awkward and and embarrassing yeah, yeah, yeah. and shameful and yeah. uh, because you're stepping out of what has been what you've been led to believe is the normal thing to do yeah. so by saying this you're kind of removing yourself from a, a narrative that's far more easy to just slot into and say yeah this is great how is yeah. it you know yeah 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 <laughs> now this this show you're just at the beginning of the tour yes. you're you're going on with the tour throughout the year and any at glastonbury i think no i'm i'm, ta- I'm i host the poetry stage ah, at glastonbury okay. so okay. i would love to take it to glastonbury but the trouble is there's a lot of um video and uh, photo yeah, yeah. stuff in there okay. and there's just not not the right environment n- not the right yeah, environment yeah, yeah. yeah i was Fair enough. yeah we, we chatted about it before but I mean, there's a lot of scenes of sexy beefcake being tortured. We don't want that to be leaked out by the side. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> but this, where do, this is an amazing sort of point in your career because you are you are an extremely um, well written academic. You've Thank researched you. considerably. You are an expert in the the revolutionary Russian poet Vladimir Mayakovsky. Yes. Um, you've come to this tell us a little bit about what what's what's gone before and that kind of academic thought that's brought you to this thank you yeah i mean i guess the thing that's similar in them all is me fastening onto something and then obsessively pursuing it to the i wondered that i wondered <laughs> <the final> that. <laughs> and so with mayakovsky i was doing um an ma at sussex university yeah. and one of the modules was marxism module and I didn't really know anything about Marxism um, at that time. And I was reading the poetry of this guy, Vladimir Mayakovsky, who I'd never heard of. Mm. And it was this, ex- like this 25 page poem, 30 page poem, A Cloud in Trousers, and in English translation, of course. And I just couldn't believe what I was reading. It was so incredible, so passionate, so kaleidoscopic, kind of impenetrable at first read yeah. and I was I found myself crying in total exhilaration yeah, yeah, yeah. in this cafe that I was reading it at in rather and I thought my god if this is in English how do you come to an English translation like that the, the idioms and the stuff like that I just couldn't understand so yeah. that made me read some other translations and see that they were quite different and partly I wanted to see which was correct of course there is no correct translation but I also just, I mean, Mayakovsky's life itself is so yeah. extraordinary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought, dude, if I ever travel because back... Because he in... was writing all the way through the revolution, wasn't he? Yeah, he started writing, yes, before. And this poem was a pre-revolutionary poem. It was yeah. published in 1915. So it's full of this fervour and unrest. And yeah, yeah. a lot of it was um, censored at the time. And he and his poetry friends got it back from the printers with all of these bits censored in filled it all out by hand wow. and um, and then put them on sales. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like... And he wrote children's poetry. Yes, well. yeah. And yeah. actually that was something, what I discovered when I was researching his work for my PhD was that very few things have been translated into English and other kind of Western European languages. Mm. A Cloud in Trousers being one, it's had a lot of translations. But he wrote, so it, it kind of got this image of him as a kind of, kind of James Dean of poetry, this kind of s- s- kind of sultry, sexy, glowering, sort of womanising kind of figure because it's a lot of passionate poetry. Yeah. It's very unashamedly passionate. Um, but I discovered in my research that he did a lot of really feminist poetry about the, the value of domestic life, the importance of freeing women from domestic mm. servitude. And yeah, this series of poems for children, which... Um, one or two of them had ever been translated right. a, a long time ago and like decades out of print. So it's um, a real concern at the moment, though, isn't it? Given what's going on in the world about protecting the work of Russian artists, because you know, I, I, I experienced it personally when the war broke out in Ukraine. I was lobbied around mm. Russian artists in our program across our stages and told to told to cancel Russian artists. And yeah. you know we. It, it, I, I, I could 
sort of understand that feeling, but my response at the time was, as far as I'm aware, the Russian Philharmonic of Novosibirsk haven't invaded Crimea. So, yes. you know, let, let's just wait a moment and we will still play Russian music because, you know, it's on a different time. How, 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 how are we going to negotiate that to protect that against world events? Uh, yeah, it's a good question because, I mean, I know, for example, the Russian choir in Brighton has been renamed the Slavic Choir right. um, because they want to kind of emphasise this... Uh, you know, support for Ukraine. Yeah. Um, and, you know, obviously Norwich is a UNESCO city of literature. Right. Previously, I'd been um, involved in some stuff with Ulyanovsk in Russia, city of literature. They are, I think, technically still a city of literature, but there's kind of no connection. It's very difficult even to get into the country, yeah. to get money out when you're there. I've got a lot of friends and artists in Russia who are... Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the kind of this, the punitive economic sanctions, which, of course, I understand. And, you know, I also have Ukrainian friends and, and all the Russian friends I have are, you know, not um, Putinists. They are, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. they, they are, uh, you know, they were at the beginning actively demonstrating until it, it's just become impossible now mm. to do that. There's such silencing, but it is. Yeah, it's difficult. It's but you you can only hope that when the fighting is done that this you know the revolution was a fertile period in russia for artists yes. isn't it yeah that if we fast forward 50 years there's going to be another mayakovsky that yeah, emerges I think so. from from this period yeah and and mayakovsky is still held up as a kind of revolutionary figure i mean there, yeah. there are protests held around the mayakovsky statue in moscow which is this enormous brilliant statue um and so he's and poetry readings happen around there i think these things were happening and they were broken up yeah um although weirdly there was in ukraine there was a street i read this news article called mayakovsky street and it was renamed boris johnson street i mean no words <laughs> absolutely no words i know <laughs> it's my mind was blown i was like okay things are more dire than i thought to the fry and put into the fire i think <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, yeah, Rosie, your career your career has been I I incredible, and Muscle Band I, I, it says an amazing show. What what's next for you then? What you you do sound like somebody that that gets this idea and really, 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 really goes after it until you fully interrogated it. What what's in the pipeline? Um, well, I think that so finishing these Mayakovsky poems is the next thing, yeah. and also um, I'm working on my next poetry collection of my own. The last couple of years I've been doing this, working on this video game for Zaum, yeah. um, which I'm, I've stopped doing now. But I th I've become obsessed with a, a linking of things. They've kind of blended together in my mind. One of them is um, the, the second half of chapter nine of The Wind in the Willows, which I, which, I, I, okay. uh, which is the one where, I mean, I had, I, it's cut out of all the film versions, but the water rat, who, as we know, yeah. loves the river, yeah, yeah, meets yeah. a traveling rat and they have, and but is it, I think it's actually a, a coded um, gay thing and wow. the, the water rat, it, this is how I think of it, suddenly there's this other person who shows him another way he's a traveller, he's got an earring yeah. he's uh, kind of dangerous and the water rat realises that all he's got isn't what it's cracked up to be and he, he, he chooses to go and he's going to go and have this other life and the mole wrestles him to the ground and st prevents him from going and he's got in these paroxysms of grief so there's this I mean, that sounds like a very niche and particular... You've got me <laughs> obsessed with that now. Yeah. Uh, I've just lost hours this evening finding that. Yes, yeah, find it. Yeah, that you can... That, yeah, I, I've listened to and read that chapter so many times. And so I, I be, if there's something for me in combination with this, the letters of Vincent van Gogh, this kind of passionate yeah. clarity of um, purpose and... Um, a piece of music by the French 17th century composer Marin Marais, mm -hmm. which is based on a 14th century dancing tuned La Folia. Yeah. Uh, all three, uh, uh, well, I guess Van Gogh isn't very niche, but uh, they're kind of circulating around in my brain in a way that at the minute I think, Rosie, this is too niche even for you, <laughs> but I'm going to try and put them together. It, there's something about this kind of following passion and being free and blind pursuit of art no matter where it takes you that yeah, yeah, yeah. um i find very intoxicating well on that note rosie i love talking to you and i love the way your brain works and 
thank you for joining us on Norwich Theatre Talks. It's been amazing to talk to you and enjoy the rest of the Muscle Band Tour. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. My loneliness is killing me. Juliet plunges Romeo's dagger into her heart. What if Juliet didn't die? That should almost be the start of the play. Hit me. Place. I'm Stephen Crocker and you're listening to Norwich Theatre Talks. We've just been talking to Dr Rosie Carrick and now my next guest is drawn from our wonderful Norwich Theatre staff team. Generations of people coming to Norwich or studying or living in Norwich will know our iconic Playhouse Bar. For more than 20 years, it's been a safe and creative space at the heart of our city. And my next guest is the person at the helm of the Playhouse Bar team. It's Fernando Santos Castilla, our Playhouse Bar Manager. Fernando, welcome to Norwich Theatre Talks. Thank you. Now, you have been with us at Norwich Theatre for, oh, it's not even a year. It's about seven months now. Seven months. And uh, you are the person behind leading our brilliant Playhouse Bar team here. Um, tell us a little bit about the bar for those that haven't haven't visited. Yeah. Um, so it's a really, I feel like it's quite a staple of Norwich. Um, I'm new to Norwich. I've only been here for about eight months now. Yeah. Um, and as soon as I saw the job and applied for it, everybody that I told mentioned the Playhouse and said that they knew it and loved it and, and that it's a, a nice welcoming space. Yeah. Um, and that's reflected from my first visit. It's a very open, creative, queer friendly. We accept any type of people from any walks of life. It's a really lovely, like, community hub. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is nice. It's more than just a, just a standard pub. It's it's, really the creative word is, is really strong, isn't yeah. it? Because when you come into the space, you know, it, it, it doesn't have a corporate feel. We've yeah. really tried to, over the years, um, you know, develop that sense of uniqueness, the city on the ceiling, which yeah. is hanging on in there, yeah. hanging on in there. <laughs> yeah. Um, the fish have become part of the, the fabric. Yeah. And, and actually your team are, are predominantly very creative people, some working yeah. a, a, as artists themselves. That's really important to the vibe, isn't it? Oh, yeah, definitely. It's When I first started, I, I did reviews with everyone and asked what was important for things they wanted to change, things they didn't want to change. And pretty much every person said they wanted the vibe and the creativity to stay. Yeah. Um, we have a lot of, like you said, a lot of members of the team which are artists and we get to do a lot of exhibits here. Um, I've seen a lot of the artists uh, that we work with put their own work and it's really lovely being surrounded by creative people that nurture that environment and, and really flourish in it. It's um, it, it's something that we, we talk about as Norwich Theatre a lot is the, the unique history of this building and the bar and the theatre coming together and... You know, the, the bar operates as as supporting the theatre, but also, you know, it, it is a destination in its own right, isn't it? You're open yeah. a lot of hours during the yeah. week, many more hours than the theatre operates. Oh, yeah. Well, um, this week, for example, we have three days of shows on, but we're open seven days, so yeah. most of the week we are just functioning as a bar. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, important to have a space like this in in the middle of the city that, that gives welcome, that you see regulars coming back. You have a core group, don't you? Some, oh, yeah. And I often pass through the bar, and what touches me is that you'll see people coming in on their own. Yeah. Actually, and that's special that people feel safe to do that. Yeah. It's it's a really safe space. Um, we in, in this room a lot, we get a lot of people that will come into work by themselves, and um, it's nice. We, we've got such regular customers. In fact, some of our staff... Uh, came in here when they were younger and have grown up oh, yeah, coming yeah, into yeah. the playhouse and now work here. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's really lovely seeing that 
that family community spirit. And now tell us a, a little bit more about you because you are a creative as well. And yeah. I'd love you to tell us a bit about that. And yeah. you moved here from Yorkshire, didn't yeah. you, to come yeah. and join from us? from Leeds. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I was um, I was running Junkyard Golf Club in Leeds, oh, um, right. which is a big like... That's been a phenomenon, hasn't it, yeah. Junkyard? Um, yeah. yeah, it's like a crazy golf nightclub, essentially. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, it was very wild. Um, but I moved down here to be close to my partner. Um, and I fell in love with Norwich. It's such a creative art, you see. Yeah. Like you said, I do a lot of I do a lot of art in my spare time. I'm very much a just anything creative. I love. Um, so I do like knitting, sewing, crochet. Uh, I like painting. I do digital art. I do tattoos. I do a wide variety of any anything that I get to use my creativity and I, I flourish with. Yeah, yeah. And is that a good? kind of yin yang because it, it is an amazing space to play house bar but it's a bar and it's busy yeah and that can be intense can't it at, at, yeah. at times you know so is, is that an outlet for you yeah well i mean i i thrive in the environment of hospitality to be honest yeah. i grew up in it my my dad owned a restaurant so i cannot remember the first time i was in a hospitality environment it's just been something from day one so i i like the the chaos and the <laughs> the the wildness of of working in a bar yeah yeah and I, i've always wondered this and i mean when i when i was coming here i worked in bars and, and cafes and restaurants myself but when you're when you're not in work and yeah. out of work is that the last place you want to be <laughs> yeah i i do uh it's sort, sort of, of like the person who works in the chocolate factory generally hates chocolate yeah <laughs> <laughs> to be honest i spend more time up at the theater when i'm not in work you because, do uh, i go to see pretty much every Every show that's put on up there. What have you seen recently that you've enjoyed? Um, I went to see The Wizard of Oz last night. Oh, yeah, that was yeah. fantastic. Yep. Um, I went to see Six last week as well. Another incredible show. Started out in this very building yes. back in 2018. Yes, that's really exciting. My partner went to see it when it was first here. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, he, he came with me the other day and he said it was nice seeing how it developed and grown in that time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And over the years, because you've, you've got a distinguished career in hospitality... Have you seen have you seen that change? I mean COVID was was a big deal for the hospitality yeah. industry. Yeah, you know, scary, scary period. Yeah. You know, we, we we were lucky here that we were able to open and we did different things. We took the playhouse bar out in tents at one point. Yeah. Um has has it changed over oh, the year? Yeah, one one hundred percent. Yeah. Um I think the biggest influence that it's had on the industry is that a lot of the younger generation, so for, for instance, when I was younger, I started going out around 15, 16, and you go out with people that yeah. are a bit older, and you learn how to how to behave in a bar, how to, how to socialise, and you get used to those situations. Mm. There's a big chunk of people that grew up that were turning 17, 18 during the pandemic that never got those experiences. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In my, uh, in my last bar, I worked with a lot of younger people, and I remember someone that was, it was their 19th birthday, and it was their first time ever going out. Wow. Because they'd never experienced it, because their yeah. entire adult drinking life was during COVID. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I feel like it really put a... A weird influence on the on the younger generation and it's affected how people come out and drink and it's, yeah. it's created a much different atmosphere i think that people a lot of the times now when they come out they stay to themselves whereas when i was younger going out drinking it was a lot of socializing with many random people but i feel yeah. like that's that's died out a little bit yeah 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 uh, yeah that, that that was the thing wasn't it? it's who you'd meet along the way yeah. that was part of the part of the fun and i was reading something the other day that there is a whole generation whole generation z that are staying away from drinking yeah. and uh, not coming to pubs and bars, they're spending their time elsewhere. You, do you think you're seeing that in the customer base we have coming through? Oh yeah, definitely. Like here, we we have a big uh, like young crowd that comes yeah. in because we're really close to the universities, um, and it's surprising how many of them will come in and get non-alcoholic they will get teas yeah, we yeah. this is the only bar i've worked on that we serve herbal teas at yeah, like 10 yeah. p.m to and an amazing selection of them actually yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah i've definitely noticed the drinking culture dying down a bit there's obviously always going to be that group especially with like students that want to go out and pie and, and drink yeah, yeah. but there's a very diverse range of of younger people yeah now. yeah and I think I think people can often think that working in a bar or running a bar the best job in the world you run the playhouse bar but actually it comes with a lot of responsibility particularly for looking after people and yeah. keeping people safe whilst they're here that's yes. that that's a lot isn't it yeah it, it is a lot but it's it's very rewarding mm -hmm. I I started in hospitality when I was 14 um so 
hospitality back then was quite a rough place. Um, there was a lot of poor, poorly trained managers. There was not a lot of equality and fairness. Mm. And I like working in this role and being able to provide the type of environment that I wish I'd had when I was in those roles, creating a safe place for the team and for the customers and promoting like a nice, comfortable space for everyone to be yeah. in. And you are a creative, you enjoy being part of this organisation, seeing the work on the stage. I guess, you know, one of the things that we, we, we possibly don't talk about enough as Norwich Theatre is, you know, the bar does make a profit, but all of that profit is planned straight back into the work of the organisation. So, you know, I, I often think we aren't funded by the Arts Council, but it's the Playhouse Bar team that funds our new productions, that funds our artist development, that funds our community engagement work. That, that, that... that that nice feeling you know yeah because the hard work that you guys are putting in it's not going to shareholders it's going back into the art yeah it, it does feel wonderful working for a creative company it's one of the things that attracted me to this job when yeah. i saw that it was linked with the theater and and that i'd get to help to nurture those shows and help to drive the success of them it's it's a great feeling yeah now the playhouse bar is always buzzing um and i know you you're planning all sorts of things tell us some things we can look forward to coming up at the bar over the next few months um so i really want to focus this year on more events and uh like clubs and themed nights i would really like to do a, a pub quiz that i want to get set up yeah. um a couple of the supervisors are actually starting a um it's called like an antisocial book club Okay. Um, so the idea is it's a space for people to get together in like a nice calm space to read together, not necessarily having to read the same book or discuss it, but just a place that people can come that find it easier reading with company. Um, lots of things like that. We're creating an events committee uh, soon that can plan in different events. Amazing. I'd love to do an alternative night here. Or I'd love to do a specifically queer night here. Um, so yeah, lots, lots of ideas. We're just starting <laughs> to kind of formulate them now. Fantastic. Oh, Fernando, thank you for joining us. And you will see Fernando behind the bar in the Playhouse. And now you can you can say hello. And good luck for all those events. And thank you very much for everything thank you, you very do. Much. Cheers. Thank you for listening to us on Norwich Theatre Talks once again. My huge thanks to Dr. Rosie Carrick and to Fernando Santos Castilla for joining me as my guests. On our next episode, I'll be talking to a legend. Having started his career on New Faces in the 70s, all the way through a career in children's television, through to now being a legend of musical theatre and starring in The Wizard of Oz that's on tour. My star guest on the next episode will be none other than Gary Wilmot. Please tune in again, and I look forward to speaking to you again then. Bye.